Tink to tink the not easy. In this session we're going to discuss uh, principally sampling in qualitative and quantitative research but we're going to discuss it by looking particularly at um, the condition of generalizability. So I'm going to start by discussing four principal aims of uh, any piece of social scientific research which are causal validity, measurement validity, uh, authenticity which is somewhat more specific to qualitative research and then generalizability which will be the focus of today. So in any piece of research, we always aim to establish, um, amongst other things, but principally um, these four things. Causal validity we've talked about quite a bit already. And this is trying to establish the extent to which something causes something else. Does exposure to violent video games cause violence and so on. And causation, as we said, is always difficult to establish and it's always complex. So causal factors are never singular. If we look at the causal factors of the Black Lives Matter, movement, um, if we look at the causal factors underpinning the uprisings in various US cities over the summer, obviously the causal factor in that wasn't just the killing of George Floyd, it was a whole host of other factors including systemic racism, the conduct of the police and so on. And in some cases centuries, uh, decades and centuries old if we think of things like systemic racism and um, sort of the founding factors that went into, that determined if you like the development of future race relations in the United States. And as an example of this, um, I think I mentioned this in week one already, about four years ago in the Irish Times, this article appeared talking about the proliferation of trees in wealthy areas, and that in these areas, residents were up to 20 times more likely to have a tree on their street. And th the discussion that followed this on public radio was quite interesting because um, amongst one of the callers, somebody suggested that, you know, one of the, one of the remedies perhaps um, to local deprivation might be to plant more trees. And this is a classic example of of a causal fallacy or an error in causal reasoning. Um, in this case, I'm mistaken the direction, but also not appreciating the fact uh, that causality is complex. Areas are not simply deprived because they don't have enough trees. Um, and conversely, if we observe that there are more trees in wealthy areas, it's not going to do much good as a remedy to promote you know, tree planting and growth uh, in more deprived areas. That's not to say, of course, that, the, that it's not important and there wouldn't be value in it. But when we're talking specifically about um, strategies for addressing poverty and deprivation, obviously you should be aware um, planting trees is not one of them. So the second example then measurement validity is the extent to which we can be certain that we have measured something. In any given study we always want to measure a number of different factors. So if we were conducting a study of, let's imagine that we're, we're administering a survey and that survey is asking people about fear of crime and you'd be dealing with we will have a specific session dealing with the measurement of fear of crime in a couple of weeks in tutorial. And to understand why somebody might be more or less afraid of crime, we might we, we will also need information, not just on their levels of fear of crime or the extent to which they fear crime, but we would also need other things. We would need to know their age, we would need to know their gender, their occupation, some details perhaps about their local environment, their neighborhood and so on. And these are all things to be measured. So when we talk about measuring someone's age, we, age is fairly straightforward. We ask somebody either their birthday or we get them to write their age down in years. But some concepts are much more complicated than this. Measuring something like fear, even things that we might consider to be self-evident, measuring things like ethnicity. So what, you know, if we ask someone to self-identify their ethnicity, um, that could be many, many different things to different people. So to two people born in the same country um, of similar or different race, they might identify with a different ethnicity. They might identify more with uh, their parents' ethnicity versus their ethnicity in their country of residence and so on. So there are all sorts of issues around measurement of kind of social concepts like this that are not as sort of clear cut as things like age. Um, even something like education, how would we measure education? We could ask somebody, you know, what at what age did you leave school? We could ask them, what was your terminal degree? Did you stop at second level, third level and so on? We could ask someone how many years of education they have. So when we start to ask questions like this, we are we are asking questions of measurement validity. If I give someone a question about something, how can we be sure that the question actually measures what we think we have measured? And this can be very, very complicated, especially in the case of um, opinion polls, which we'll look at later. 
Um, unless we state a question very clearly and sort of un 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 unambiguously, it can be very difficult to establish measurement validity. By way of example, let's try one that you're at this stage familiar with. Um, most of you will have rated the class already. And so let's imagine that the concept that we're trying to measure here is enjoyment of class. I want to know whether or not you enjoyed this class. And I could give you a question like this. How much did you enjoy this class? And you've got five options. So there's immensely at the top, very much, somewhat enjoyed, not sure, and enjoyed a little. Now, the ordering of these response categories is important. We will be dealing with a lot of questions like this. And as you'll see straight away, the response categories are ordered and they're hierarchical. They start with the minimal level, the, they start with the smallest level of enjoyment all the way up to the top. Now, is this a good measure of enjoyment? I would suggest not. There are several things wrong with this. First of all, the question is relatively unclear. Now, this is a little bit sort of, you know, it's not really fair of me to put this as an example. Asking someone if they enjoy something is probably unambiguous enough. You know, you're probably able to distinguish whether or not you enjoyed some, but the concept of enjoyment might not necessarily be clear to everybody. You know, did you enjoy the lectures? Did you enjoy the book, the content? Did you enjoy the tone of my monotonous voice? Did you enjoy the interaction? So enjoyment can mean different things to different people. It's a fairly subjective term. Secondly, the frame of reference. What is the frame of reference? How much did you enjoy this class? Do you mean, you know, the last hour that you took this class in particular, this hour, the entire course, the tutorial program and so on? The question's also leading. It says, how much did you enjoy this class? So it asks you, it sort of implies or it leads you towards rating enjoyment to some extent. Now, as you can see, this is kind of engineered into the question by only allowing you responses that give some kind of enjoyment. Um, the response categories are fairly unbalanced. So there are two positives. Sorry, ideally, we would have two positives, two negatives and a neutral midpoint. And we'll be talking about this in in subsequent weeks. But you'll see here I've, I've given you the option of saying immensely, very much, somewhat, not sure, and enjoyed a little. So there's no option to say that you didn't enjoy the course. So the question is leading, there's issues in the phrasing, there's issues in the responses, all sorts of things. So when we talk about measurement validity, we might say this is not a valid measure of enjoyment for all of these reasons. Second one would be something like this. Um, so let's imagine the concept we're measuring is uh, compliance with COVID restrictions or regulations. How compliant are you with mask wearing and social distancing? So in this case, it's a little bit better because the response set that we're giving the respondent, right? We've got sort of two agree options. There's strong agreement, strong disagreement, light agreement, light disagreement, and this neutral midpoint. And this is quite an important property of questions, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks time. But again, the question is leading and it says, how compliant are you? There are ways we could ask this to be a little bit more neutral. It's not a terrible way to ask it, but it's not entirely it's not entirely um, it's not entirely neutral in terms of its wording. But the real issue with this one is that this is actually asking two questions. How compliant are you with mask wearing and social distancing? So as we know anecdotally from being out and about, these are very separate things in terms of compliance. Someone can be wearing a mask, but they can be standing quite close to you. Someone can be standing far away unmasked. So um, again, the attitudes um, and the beliefs that feed into why someone might comply with mask wearing versus why they might not comply with social distancing, they're probably different. They're, they're probably different factors. So we might want to ask this by two questions. So in terms of validity, is this a valid measure? Probably not. Um, it's double barreled, it's somewhat leading. The responses are okay, but they're not great. And anyway, because the question is terrible, it means that we can't measure the concept anyway. So this is a bad measure of restriction compliance. And I'm gonna sort of move past authenticity for the moment because we'll be talking more about this when we get to talking about qualitative research. And authenticity is more to do with the extent to which we're confident that the people that we've spoken to in a study have given us um, enough information for us to acquire a full understanding um, of their experiences and their understandings of a situation. But the subject of today is generalizability. And you're all familiar at this stage with the concept of generalizability. Um, and actually the, one of the sort of, if you like, a beneficial consequences of the last couple of months is that there are, there are now all sorts of things all sorts of sort of terms and concepts to do with social research that you're familiar with because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, generalizability is one of them. And generalizability, uh, when we talk about generalizability, we're talking about the extent to which the findings that we, or the data that we generate from a sample of people. So again, in research, we can never interview everybody that we want to talk to. Um, sort of the gold standard for if we wanted to know, if, if we wanted to know what the level of compliance was out there on the island of Ireland, with COVID-19 regulations, we would ask everybody. 
we would take a census, but that's impossible. Um, and the vast, vast majority of criminological research asking everybody who we want to talk to is impossible um, for resource reasons, for feasibility, practicality. So we always work with samples, generally. Um, that's not to say we can't use census data for our own purposes, and indeed criminologists do this quite often and frequently. But generally the studies that you will mostly encounter, the studies that you will conduct yourselves, will deal with samples. So sample generalizability is really, really important because unless we are confident that the researchers have selected a sample that is sufficient to give them a representative overview of the problem, um, then we can have no confidence in the findings. And there are two aspects to this. The first is sample generalizability. Um, so do the findings of an Irish study of pathways to homelessness apply to all cases in Ireland? If we were reading a research article that looked at and the research article was an article that tried to establish the causal pathways to homelessness. So let's say they were trying to understand how people um, end up moving from, so those who are currently homeless, how do they end up moving from, say, the private rental sector into homelessness? And they ask people about their experiences. And let's imagine in the course of reading that paper, you discovered that the respondents only spoke to people in inner city Dublin. The question we would then ask there would be one of sample generalizability. Do we think that this, the experience of those people in Dublin is representative enough of the phenomenon of homelessness in Ireland at large. And the questions there we might ask about are, well, what about rural homelessness, which again is in relatively in the minority, but you know might be might be a factor. Um, the fact that the concept of homelessness itself is quite is quite terse. Homelessness is a transitory state in many cases. So people, you know, they move from place to place without a permanent residence, but they might not necessarily be sleeping on the streets. They might have shelter. There are people that move in and out of curated accommodations uh, within cities and so on, uh, managed hostels and that. So homelessness is a really, really complex issue. And the experience of homelessness um, in Dublin, say with Dublin's homeless social services, might be very, very different to someone living in Cork, Washford, Galway, Belfast and so on. Um, but you get the idea. Cross-population generalizability then deals with the extent to which the findings of an Irish study would apply to um, individuals in a different context. For example, if we were trying to, let's say, as a researcher in Britain, if you were trying to understand pathways to homelessness in Britain, would an Irish paper or would a paper based on interviews with Irish homeless people, would that give you a sense of the issues at play in Britain, in Sweden, with its comparatively more extensive social and affordable housing systems versus the United States, let's say, with a highly residual welfare state with low levels of protection and quite a strong emphasis on private home ownership, again, somewhat similar to Ireland. So cross-population generalizability is the extent to which we can take the findings from one location and apply them in another. Um, it's not, it doesn't just deal with sort of countries, but the easiest way to understand the notion of cross-population generalizability is at the country level. Can findings from one country be applied, be applied to another? And incidentally, just to prefigure some of what's coming, if you look at some of these countries here, so Britain, the United States in particular, you know, we can, oftentimes you'll find that we can compare countries like this um, that are sort of socially similar, or economically similar, so that have kind of the same occupational profiles, similar systems of government and so on. And the penal systems are quite different. Of course, we wouldn't necessarily compare, you know, the experiences of Irish police to the US police, that sort of armed versus unarmed um, control is devolved in the United States to the state and county levels and so on. But whenever we draw a sample, we always run the risk of introducing sample error. Now, this is inherent in any research based on samples. Uh, whenever we draw a sample, we always introduce a degree of error. And sampling error simply means the difference between a population value and a sample value. So let's imagine using this example down here. Uh, this is the population, let's say, of individuals over here. And let's say we want to know the average income of this group of people. Let's say this is uh, senior managers in a sample of law firms, let's say. And we want to know what the average salary amongst these people is. Now, let's say we draw a subsample from this of six people. And we just ask these people what their income is. Now, straight away, we've introduced the potential for sampling error because we don't know. First of all, we don't know. Maybe we have just, you know, oversampled individuals with an exceptionally high income. Maybe four of these people down here, let's say these four people here are very high earners and these people are very low earners, these two. In which case, if we calculate average income based on just this small group, we've introduced quite significant sampling error because 
the measured average income from the sample is quite different to what the real figure would have been in the population. In practice, we never really know what the population value is because, again, we can't ask everybody. So it's always a lot of the challenge in research is establishing using somewhat different techniques, the extent to which we might have um, encountered or generated a finding that's due to sampling error. The other issue then is the notion of sampling variation. And let's imagine, I'll be showing you an example of this in a few slides time, so I'll just go through this quickly. Let's imagine we return those six individuals to this group and we sample a different set. Let's say we sample this person, this person, uh, these three people down here, and then this person over here. So now we've got a different sample. And if we were to calculate the average income of just this subsample group, again, we would find not only would it differ from the average of the original group, we would also find it would differ from the true population average of all these people, if indeed we knew that. This is really important because in criminology, the things that we're going to measure are not necessarily income. Sometimes we will want to know this, but more often we might want to ask um, in crime and victimization surveys, we might want to ask uh, the number of encounters a person has had with law enforcement. And again, because a lot of these studies are based on samples, we always run the risk that, you know, the average number of encounters with law enforcement um, might differ from the real figure uh, of encounters from law enforcement because of sampling error and sampling variation. Now, sampling error is crucially important in, in several walks of life. And just to give you an example from something that's up and coming in the next couple of weeks, the US presidential election. So this is a time series of uh, Reuters opinion poll data going back to, uh, I think it's about mid-April, yeah. So the first point is mid-April, and these are weekly opinion polls taken by Reuters. So they ask several questions in these polls, but what we're looking at here um, are the shares of voters who say they would opt for either Trump or Biden. Now, according to these different polls, and there are several sources for these, there's Reuters, there's PW, um, there's various media agencies and so on collated together. We know that for the majority of the presidential campaign, there has been quite a substantial in places gap um, between the lead of Trump over, sorry, between the lead of Biden over Trump. So Biden is up here in the in the triangle. Um, the only point at which they achieved parity, according to this Reuters poll, was down here in late, uh, I believe, sorry, I should have indexed this axis a little bit better, um, in early May. And the last data point that we have here is around the 1st of October, which shows them quite far apart. So Biden with, by some accounts, and again, according to other opinion polls at this time, there was a 13 point lead between the two. Now, the problem is that these um, these are opinion polls and they are based on samples. So Reuters take a random selection of individuals, different polling agencies use different methods to do this. Um, and they ask just that subsample of a couple of thousand people generally uh, who their first preference would be. And the problem here is that this introduces the possibility for error. And we're actually able to quantify this in the context of opinion polls because opinion polls tend to work, a lot of them tend to work within the same rough range of sample sizes. Um, you'll often see this in Ireland, the case it's about sort of one and a half thousand to two and a half, three thousand. And what this does is, what this means is that we can actually calculate with some degree of accuracy what the error margin of these is because these are based on samples. Right, so at each point here, Reuters interviews uh, a sample of one and a half thousand Americans, and that's a very small subset of the population. And based on that sample size, we know that there is a potential for 3% of error in the estimates. If we just take the reported vote share, vo voter preference, sorry, for Trump at each point in time, we see here that it could actually, the true figure could actually be three points above, or, or it could be three points below. So, and that goes for all of these, because again, all of these different points at which they interview people for their opinion poll, they use more or less the same sample size. So there's always this potential margin of error here. And if we overlap this, these margins with both Biden's vote share and Trump's vote share, we see that actually within the margin of error, we see here, if there's sort of this three percentage point margin of error across each of these, it's really, really difficult to be certain what the actual true value might be. So if we just look at May 6th here, we see that on May 6th, Reuters recorded Trump at 38% and Biden at 39 It was the lowest difference they recorded between the two candidates for the entire time series, one point between them. But if we factor the margin of error, right? So because there are there is a potential for plus or minus 3% on both candidates, it is possible. Now it's less likely, but it's possible that Biden's true score was actually 36 and Trump was 41, that there wasn't a lead at all. 
Now that's very unlikely, but the point I'm trying to demonstrate is that whenever we work with sample data, we are inherently working with data that has the potential for error, either through sampling error or sampling variation. Opinion polls are a classic example. Of this. Whenever you open up a newspaper, if you look at a newspaper this weekend, there will be an opinion poll of some sort. Um, the Sunday Business Post, uh, I think the Irish Times on a Saturday, but I'm not sure. They often publish uh, opinion polls where they'll ask people uh, their preferred party, their opinions of party leaders and so on. And you'll often see within this the margins of error published is around 3%. This is really, really important for criminological research because no matter what it is we're measuring, in this case we're just looking at opinion polls, but in criminology we're dealing with different properties. And because we work with samples there's always this potential for error. Now it's not always 3%. In this case this is an opinion poll. It's a function of the sample size and using a fairly sort of standard calculation um, we know or we can be reasonably sure that the gap it's about 3%. Um, I'll be showing you how this is done, uh, I think, around week 7. And this is really, really important because four years ago we were kind of in the same situation. Um, the opinion polls were predicting a fairly clear-cut win for Clinton in terms of the popular vote. This was Hillary Clinton versus Trump in the runoff in the 2016 presidential election. And so even sort of right up to the eve of the election, um, this is a collated time series. So this is taking the average of all available public opinion polls across this time and averaging the candidates vote share over time. This is from 2016. And we see here that despite the lead sort of narrowing and increasing at certain critical points, um, this was the email leak scandal, I believe, emerged well, so for a given definition of scandal, I think was emerged somewhere around here. So the poll sort of widened a little bit. But as it got closer, most agencies were predicting a fairly clear win for Clinton in terms of the popular vote. Now, as you're probably aware, the US electoral system is not based, it's not a simple runoff. Um, you don't get elected president by winning the most votes. Um, George W. Bush didn't win the popular vote in 2000. Uh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote, I believe, in 2016. I'm not entirely sure of that, actually, you might want to check that. But basically, the US president is elected based on the electoral college system. Um, so state by state, um, you'll see this important when, when they talk about swing states in the coming weeks in the US election. Um, state by state, the voters uh, express their preference through the popular vote and then the electoral college is convened and the electors, the members of that college, uh, vote for their preferred candidate. Um, faithful electoral voters, electoral college members, sorry, in theory should vote for their state's, prefer state's preferred candidate. But the number of uh, members of the Electoral College varies from state by state, so it's not a simple clear-cut case of you win the popular vote, you win the presidency, and um, the candidates need to win particular states. Nonetheless, every poll uh, on 2016, bar the IBD poll, had Clinton on a fairly secure popular vote lead, in some cases as wide as, he, as, as you can see here, about six points. So, in some respects, we didn't see Trump's victory coming the first time. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the post election analysis on this focused on focused on the role of the role of polls, and the fact that over the last couple of years polling methodologies had changed quite substantially. And some of the factors underpinning this we'll look at in a moment. Uh, a lot of it was to do with the fact that people had shifted from consuming their media um, through sort of print media and through television to online, and. The fact was that a lot of these polling agencies were still using phone in, so they were using random uh, random dialing. They were they were essentially dialing phone numbers and asking people over the phone their preference. Uh, and because less and less people had landlines, and there was an education gradient to this too, they found that those individuals with higher education were less likely to have a fixed landline. They were using mobiles and so on. Also rural voters and so on. So the polls were underestimating uh, the vote share within particular social groups. Now we know with some degree of accuracy, the polls are still relatively accurate. Um, and this paper, which is linked down here, Jangs and Willitsman in 2018, actually did a, sort of this collated study where they looked at the mean absolute vote poll error. So this is the difference between uh, the observed and predicted. So what was the average points difference between the outcome um, and what the uh, and what the polls at the time were predicting? So the vote, the error shifts over this over time over the course of an election. So polls are least accurate further out, but the closer we get to the election, and particularly in the final months, we should see them, we should see the margin of error of those polls narrowing to about 2% uh, and sub 2% in the couple of days before. Incidentally, this also holds in elections. And as we see down here, 
um, in the author study of Ireland, there is the uh, the the error for a poll. Sorry, the error for opinion polls uh, in predicting election outcomes in Ireland has been more or less hovering around two percent. This is based on the twenty sixteen election. So based on the four opinion polls that the authors look at here, the average rate of error with these, on average, they were out by about 2%. They got it wrong. So their their prediction of the vote share that would go to each party in 2016 was wrong by approximately two percentage points. So the question that a lot of people were asking themselves in the wake of the 2016 election was, why didn't we see it coming? Why didn't we see Trump's victory coming? Um, and the answers, a lot of the answers to that looked at the polling not necessarily the polling methodologies and stuff, the, the way the ways in which they answer the questions, but how they sampled. So there's a problem with online polls in particular, which is what we call selection bias. Online polls are mainly self-selecting. And the crudest example of this would be if you're sitting at your computer and you see a pop-up to complete a survey. Um, do you decide to fill out that survey? Yes or no? And they're self-selecting because in a sense you have you have the decision to decline. And we know that people don't decline these things on random. Certain types of people are more likely to answer them. Certain types of people are less likely. And that's what makes them biased. It's the self-selection bias. And this has to do with all sorts of things. But one, one issue was inequality of access to IT. Um, in the conduct of online polls, not all people had access to computers, tablets, laptops, smartphones, etc. So the polls were underestimating the opinions of voters who had access to that technology who they believed in the aftermath of the election were more likely to vote for Clinton. So they, un sorry, were um, were more likely to vote for Clinton. So therefore those people who were on their devices um, were preferred and were oh, by a slight majority were Democrat voters and were gonna vote for Hillary anyway. So they underestimated the vote share of Trump. Non-response bias is always an issue. Um, as we said, the question there then is when you're presented with a poll and regardless of whether it's online, if someone calls you on the phone um, and you decide, you know, are you going to answer the question or are you going to tell them, oh, I'm sorry, I'm busy, you know, I've got, to, I've got something to do, I've got the child that's calling me or whatever. Um, we know that less educated voters are less likely to respond to polls. They're more likely to, to decline to answer a poll. And there is an educational gradient to Republican voting as well. Um, the voters who did vote for Donald Trump tended to be less educated. So the fact that, those, so the fact that educated voters were overrepresented in the polls meant that they were underestimating the vote share of Trump. Access to phones was also a problem. Um, automated random digit dialing has been in use for a long time in the US for polling. And it's a problem now because more and more people are switching away from fixed landlines with publicly listed phone numbers. The majority of households now no longer have fixed landlines. So that means if you are relying on gathering uh, a representative sample by using a sample of phones using random digit dialing, it means you're going to have significant error there as well. Also, um, there was very little, it was in the aftermath of this, PW or Pew Research wrote a commentary about why they missed the mark. And they suggested that a lot of this was to do with the misunderstanding of the calculation of confidence margins. And the fact that when you see these things reported on TV, yes, sometimes they do report the, mar the margin of error, oftentimes they don't, and that there is a misunderstanding in the public domain about margins of error. Um, this becomes critically important in a moment. I'm uh, sorry, in, in the present day, this is critically important, especially where we're at now, because there is so much information flying around about the calculation of, you know, rates of infection of coronavirus, uh, public attitudes about compliance, compliance with measures and so on. And in the main, one of the things that we've certainly noticed over the last couple of months is um, quite a, a, a significant miscommunication about the role of error in these things. Maybe that's a discussion for another day, and we will get to this in a couple of weeks. Uh, but for the moment, uh, trust me when I say that you're all at this stage, um, and especially in light of the last six months, adequately exposed to the ins and outs of sampling and representation and all this sort of stuff.